Did you hear that story about the uh, wedding where the uh, groom was late for the wedding? You know, you've heard stories like that. The groom was late. Well, this groom was so late that all the bridesmaids went to sleep. And he didn't show up till midnight. Now, did you know that's a Bible story? I'm going to show you that in just a minute. Let's do our memory verses. Here's what we're covering. Matthew 25, 1 through 26, 24. That's a lot to cover, isn't it? We've got five memory verses, okay? Here they are. You might want to jot them down or note because I'm going to test you Wednesday night. Five memory verses. Matthew 25, 13. Watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour wherein the Son of Man cometh. Matthew 25, 46. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. Matthew 26 and verse 2. You know that after two days is the feast of the Passover, and the Son of Man is betrayed to be crucified. Matthew 26, 13. Verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this, that this woman hath done, be told for a memorial of her. And then Matthew 26, 24. The Son of Man goeth it is, as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It had been good for that man if he had not been born. All right, let's get into the text now and introduce this first story. Jesus is going to tell two parables, and then he's going to tell us about the judgment. You remember, they asked him, when, when shall these things be, and what shall be the sign of thy coming in the end of the world? And we talked about that. There was Jerusalem that was going to be destroyed, and he gave them the sign, and he told them what time, and it would be that generation, but then when it comes to the end of the world, when heaven and earth shall pass away, knoweth no man. And he began talking about that in Matthew 24. He continues that now into Matthew 25, and he's going to tell some parables. Now I asked the class this morning, what is a parable? Thomas gave the answer. You know what a parable is? The, the Sunday school definition of a parable that you ought to know, and I'll just jump in your mind now, it is an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. It's like, like, you know, railroad tracks are parallel, aren't they? So you lay down an earthly story, and then right beside it, you lay down what the, the spiritual, the heavenly meaning for that story is. Now that doesn't fit every situation on parables, and parables don't have to necessarily be made up stories. It could be a true story and still be a, a story with a heavenly meaning attached to it, you see. But that's a good general definition when you're thinking of a parable. And I was teasing the class, and I do this so they will remember. I'm not just being silly, but a lot of times what you remember are the silly things, isn't it? So I told her, a parable is not a pair of bulls, okay? It sounds like that, doesn't it? Like all these cows and I got a pair of bulls. Well, no, no. It's their parables, okay? So it's an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And this first one has to do with a wedding. Now, now the, uh, you know, we have bridesmaids today at weddings, don't we? That's, that's the way they usually are. They're bridesmaids. You know why they call them maids? You know, that's what they used to call virgins, maids. And so they're bridesmaids. It's interesting for me to, to look at modern weddings and then read about weddings in the Bible. And there's differences, but some things carry over. Some things are like our weddings today, but not entirely. And here's the way a wedding would work. You would be married by, by being betrothed. Now you're legally married. 
But, but you don't get to go off on a honeymoon. No, you got to go back to your parents' homes and, and wait about a year. And uh, so you're, you're, I mean, you are stuck now. <laughs> it's not like an engagement that you can break. No, you're betrothed. You'd have to be divorced to get out of a betrothal. But you're betrothed. And then sometime later, sometime it's about a year later, you would have the wedding feast. And at the wedding feast, the, the bride would get all fixed up and pretty and invite her friends over, her bridesmaids over, and they would prepare this feast in the bride's home. And the groom would leave his home and go to the bride's home, and they would go in and have a great feast. And after the feast was over, the groom would take the bride from her home and tear, carry her back to his home. And there'd usually be a parade through town or something to welcome the, the couple that are starting off now on their own family. So that's different than the way we do it today. But understanding that helps understand this parable. Here's what Jesus is going to tell. Now remember, he's talking about when he comes again, at the end of the world. So remember that. And that's the context now. And he's going to help us understand that. And what we need to do about that. Here it is. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be likened unto ten virgins. Which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. And five of them were wise. And five were foolish. They that were foolish took their lamps and took no oil with them. But the wise took oil in their vessels with their lamps. Now, we don't have lamps like that today, but you remember them, and you may have some around your house, some, some coal oil lamps or some kerosene lamps, and you'd, you'd have the little lamp, and it'd have a wick on it, and if you wanted any light, you had to have some fuel in there. Now, the wise, they took their lamps with the oil in the lamp. You know, it didn't take a high criteria to be wise in those days. I mean, you would think that's what you would do. The foolish, <laughs> they took their lamp and didn't take any oil in their lamps. Well, that lamp just not going to work if you don't have oil in it, see? Because that's what would actually burn. And so they'd have a wick and it'd draw up the oil and the oil would burn. Now, the wise took oil in their lamps. They were prepared. And the foolish went unprepared. Well, they took their lamp, but they didn't even think about the oil. Well, that was pretty pitiful, I would think. They were foolish, weren't they? Now, here's what happens. While the bridegroom tarried, they all slumbered and slept. Where's the bridegroom? This is the wedding day. We set the date a year ago, and he's supposed to show up that day. He doesn't show up till midnight, which kind of makes you wonder, did he really want to show up for this wedding? You know, you, can you imagine if that happened today? Boy, that groom would be in trouble, wouldn't he? But, but that was different. So they're waiting for him. And while he's waiting, they slept. Now, at midnight, finally, the cry was made, Behold, the bridegroom cometh. Go ye out to meet him. Well, now it's dark outside now. So here's what you do. You, you light your lamp and you go outside and you're going to go meet the bridegroom as he's coming to the bride's house. So, so then all those virgins arose and trimmed their lamps. Now, some of you have probably done that. You had this old ratty wick and you wanted a nice pretty flame so you, you trimmed the, the wick. That's what it means to trim the lamp. You know, we just don't do things like that today. I'm talking to the young people. I'm sure, I'm sure all of us that are uh, 30 and over and old, you know, we know about trimming the, the wick. Only if you haven't been camping, you probably have done that. So they trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us your oil, for our lamps are gone out. <laughs> and the wise answered. Now here's where they're really wise. Now, the wise, first, they took oil in their lamps. But the second reason they are wise, they didn't share it. Now, you think, well, you're supposed to share. But no, no, there comes a time 
Well, look, if you're not going to take care of yourself, you're going to hurt me and you too, and I just can't do this. And you've got to be wise enough to recognize that. So they were wise enough to refuse to help the foolish. It's not that the foolish couldn't have done this. They had all day to do it, and they had the money. They just waited too late, and they didn't need someone else to come down and help them out. No, you're going to have to take care of that yourself. And that's really wisdom in doing that and saying that. And so the wise answered, saying, Not so, lest there not be enough for us and you. But go ye rather to them that sell and buy for yourselves. And while they went to buy, the bridegroom came. And they that were ready went in with him to the marriage. And the door was shut. Afterward came also the other virgin, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, I know you not. Watch therefore, here's the spiritual meaning, the heavenly meaning. Watch therefore, you know neither the day nor the hour when the Son of Man cometh. You better be ready. Don't think. Oh, well, when the Lord's about to come, I'll get ready real quick. He'll come in the twinkling of an eye. You won't have time to get ready. Don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Be wise and be ready. Have the oil in your lamps. Have your wicks trimmed. And you be ready. Because when you're not thinking, he's going to come. And you want to go with him. Don't wait till the door shuts. That's the opportunity is gone. How horrible it would be for that door to shut and you're left out. So there's the earthly story. There's the heavenly meaning. Be ready. Okay, we've got another, another parable. The parable of the talents. Now, we use the word talent as abilities, and, and I'll probably say that, in the, and that's fine, because that, that's not exactly what this is. We're going to see that he gave them talents according to their abilities. A talent is actually a weight measurement, and he's talking about how much money he gave them, weighed out in silver or gold until it weighed a talent, and then that's how much gold or silver or whatever the money was that he was weighing out. That's how much you got. Now, he gave them their talents according to their abilities. And so it's easy for us to think of talents like, well, I've got, I've got a talent of quilting, you know, or I've got a talent of, uh, of, of fixing automobiles or what, whatever talent you have, you know, maybe you can maybe even play an instrument or something. And so we're going to use those, that word that way, but really that's not their abilities. Remember, the talent is actually the money they received, but they received this money according to their abilities. So we can kind of call the talents either way on this, and it still works in this parable. Now here's how it works. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a far country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. And to the one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one. Every man according to his several ability. And straightway took his journey. Now, then he that had received five talents went and traded with the same and made them five other talents. He doubled his money. That's pretty good trading, isn't it? He doubled the amount. Not on that, look what the two talent men did. Likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. He was responsible. They took what they had and they went to work. What about the fellow with one talent? I mean, he had less to worry about than any of them. Uh, this one, he had to deal with five talents. That's a lot to fool with. The one talent man, he didn't have to do a whole lot. I mean, he just had one talent. And he, just, he didn't have to look after a lot, and he didn't even do that. Here's what he did. He that had received one talent went and digged in the earth and hid 
his Lord's money. See, it's not his money. It was his Lord's money. And he hid it. Hid his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. I'm going to stop right here. You know the bridegroom tarried? The bridegroom tarried. And this master is gone a long time. Every now and then I hear people say, well now people in the New Testament thought Jesus was coming soon. And you know, some of them did. And we read about that in 2 Thessalonians. And Paul told them that they should not be uh, soon troubled. Not soon. They, some thought he was going to come right away. But the apostles did not teach that. They got the wrong idea. And Jesus didn't teach that either. He told them it'd be a long time. Pa Paul told the Thessalonians, it, it, that's not going to come until there's a falling away first. See? And if anything, Jesus told him he'd be coming after a long time. Now, it's been a long time. It has been a long time. And I'm not going to say he's coming soon, but I tell you, he could come this hour. It's not a long time. We can't count on it being a long time anymore. It's already been a long time. We don't know when he's coming. And that was the point of the parable with the foolish virgins, wasn't it? We don't know when, so we've always got to be ready. But at that time, Jesus already told him it'd be a long time. Now, after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. So, and so he that has received five talents came and brought other five, saying, Lord, thou hast delivered unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. Now notice this beautiful thing that, that the Lord said. The Lord said to him, well done, thou good and faithful servant. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done? That's where that song comes from. Won't it be grand to hear him say, well done? Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joys of the Lord. That, I, that, that sticks in my mind. When I think about my life, someday I'm going to meet my master. Those are the words I want to hear. I want to hear him say, well done, Bill. Well done. Enter into my joys. I live for that. So, well done. Now what about the two talent man? Okay. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou hast deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I've gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said unto him, Well done, good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I'll make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of the Lord. I was at the lectures and somebody was talking about that two-talent man. He said that's his favorite person in this parable. You know, the, the five-talent man, I mean, he's got five talents. And he made five more, and before this is over, he's going to get another one. And he gets a lot of attention, doesn't he? And the one-talent man, he, he messed up bad. But what about the two-talent man? He just did what he's supposed to do. He didn't act like, well, you know, look at this here. I got two. Why couldn't I just have one? How come I have to have two? To work? He didn't do that. He didn't sit there and say, well, I didn't get five. Why did he get five? I should, if I had five talents, I'll tell you what I would do. You know, but no, he took his two talents. And he was just faithful to what the Lord expected of him. There's a lot of two-talent men in the Lord's church that are just faithful to what they do. Isn't that wonderful? Listen, when we go to heaven, we are going to be in the presence of two talent men that have been faithful. And now they're rulers over many things. Don't ever sit there and say, well, I don't have enough talents. To do. Don't be that one talent man. Be faithful for what the Lord has given you. And if it's just two talents, be faithful over two. See? Then that is a good, good story about that two-talent man. Let's get back to the parable. 
Then he which had received one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man. That fella, he not only was lazy and buried his talent and didn't do anything with his Lord's money, he tried to blame it on his Lord. So you're the hard man. Now, now watch this. I knew that thou art a hard man, reaping where thou hast not sown and gathering where thou hast not strawed. And I was afraid and went and hid thy talent in the earth and lo, there thou hast, that is thine. He didn't do anything. Now, he should have gone to work. He said, I'll just bury this talent and give it back to him. And what did he do all this time? Was he out fishing? Was he out just goofing off? Just sitting down at the court square playing checkers or something? He wasn't doing anything. I tell you, his problem was he was lazy. He didn't have to do a lot. He just had one talent. He could have looked after one talent, but he didn't want to do anything. And so the Lord answered and said, Thou wicked and slothful servant. See, he was slothful. He just goofed off all that time and didn't do a thing. Thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not and gathered where I have not stalled. Thou oughtest therefore to put my money to the exchangers and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Yet least thing you could have do, put it in the bank and drawn a little interest on it. He didn't do anything with it. Take therefore the talent from him and give it to him which hath ten talents. For unto every one that hath shall be given, and the hill shall have abundance. But from him that hath not shall be taken away even that which he hath. And cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness, and there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now when the Lord talked about outer darkness and weeping and gnashing of teeth, you know what he's talking about? I know what he's talking about. And those people knew what he's talking about there because when they talked about hell as a place of eternal punishment, that's the language they used. And that's the language our Lord used. So they knew what he's talking about. All of a sudden, this isn't just a little story either. This had some eternal consequences to it. And so you see the heavenly meaning. Our Lord's coming back. And we're going to give an account for what he has entrusted us with. And what will we say? I want to hear the word. I want it be grand to hear him say, well done. That's what we want to live for. Now the Lord went right from this to talking about that last day and that judgment. And he still uses imagery in his language. He's going to talk about sheep and goats, but this really isn't a parable. This is not a parable. He's going to start telling us what will happen on that last day. The last judgment. When the Son of Man shall come in His glory. And all the holy angels with Him. Then shall He sit upon the throne of His glory. And before Him shall be gathered all nations. And He shall separate them one from another. As a shepherd separateth his sheep from the goats. And he shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on his left. Now listen, the sheep and the goats is part of the imagery with which he's talking about. The separation is real. Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come ye blessed of my father, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger and ye took me in. Naked and ye clothed me. I was sick and ye visited me. I was in prison and ye came unto me. Listen how humble these righteous are. The righteous answered and said, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered and fed thee or thirsty and gave thee drink when saw we thee a stranger and took thee in or naked and clothed thee or when saw we thee sick or in prison came unto thee I mean they're asking like what uh, we did that uh, like, is, you think that's what we did the king will answer and say to them verily I say unto you 
Inasmuch as you've done it unto one of the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. Doesn't that tell you how Christ cares about us and how he identifies with us? You remember how he said, I make him lowly in heart. And when we help the least, I, I told the class this morning that in my career, sometime I had to leave my family behind when I went to a new location. I'd, I'd get a, I'd apply for a job, they'd give it to me and say, now you gotta show up in two weeks. <laughs> Two weeks. I mean, I've got a house to move. I've got kids in school. I've got furniture. And, and they give me, sometimes I'd bargain. I'd get six weeks, but you can't get all that done in six weeks. So I'd pack up. I'd head out across the country and leave my family behind. I'd find some little old grubby place to survive for a while till I could get things arranged. And you know, every time I did that, there were people that knew me and that knew them, and they helped them. My wife with all those little children, they'd come help her. They made sure they had something to eat. If there was a problem around that, they'd come fix it. They'd, they'd just wait on them. They'd take, and you know what I felt like? I felt like they was doing it to me. I mean, when they helped them, they, I, that was helping me. And that's the way the Lord feels about us. And when we help each other that are lowly, we are God's, we are the hands that God uses to help the lowly. And he identifies with them. And when you help those in need, God's, that's just, you're doing it for me. That, that's helping me, see? So that's why he awarded them. But now what about them on the left? Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire prepared for the devil and his angels. I was hungry and you gave me no meat. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you took me not in. Naked and you clothed me not. Sick and in prison and you visited me not. Now look how they answer. It just sound, doesn't sound humble at all. Sounds like they're almost put out by this. They say, and to him, Lord, when saw we thee unhungered or a thirst or a stranger or naked or sick and in prison and did not minister unto thee? What, what are you talking about? What, when, when did we ever do that or, or not do that for you? What? Now, and he answered and said, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as you did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not unto me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment. But the righteous unto life eternal. That's the King James Version. They have the word everlasting over here and the word eternal over here. Some of the new Bibles don't do it that way. And the Greek doesn't do it that way either. I think they did it that way in the King James, just to provide variety in, in language, but it's the same word. And they could say they went into everlasting punishment or everlasting life, life everlasting, or eternal punishment or eternal life, because it's the same word, everlasting and eternal in that verse. In the Greek, it's the same word. And what it means in one place, it means in the other. It's in the same verse. You don't want that door to close and be cast into outer darkness where the punishment is weeping and gnashing of teeth and everlasting fire for everlasting punishment, do you? No. Watch and be ready for you know not the hour when your Lord doth come. Now, I've got more to cover, so just hang on. We're going to leave the, 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 the words of Jesus now and talk about some events. They wanted to kill Jesus. Those scribes and Pharisees wanted to kill him. And they were plotting against him. And they were being just like plotters do, see. They were, they were doing this undercover and trying to pull something over on the people themselves. It says here, it came to pass when Jesus had finished all these sayings, he said to his disciples, know ye that after two days is the feast of the Passover and the Son of Man is betrayed to be killed. Jesus knew what was up. He's going to be crucified. Then assembled together the chief priests and the scribes and the elders of the people unto the palace of the high priest who was called Caiaphas and consulted that they might take Jesus by subtlety and kill him. But they said not on the feast day lest there be an uproar among the people. See the plot's brewing in this evil dark scene that begins this 
26th chapter, we have a lovely little story. And it starts, it's a woman with an alabaster box. That would be a stone, a white stone that is carved out into a bottle. And it was filled with perfume, a beautiful ointment. And she anoints Jesus with this. You know, with all the evil that was around Jesus, how much that act of kindness must have meant to him. Here's the story. Now when Jesus was in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, there came unto him a woman having an alabaster box of very precious ointment and poured it on his head as he said it meat. But when the disciples saw it, they had indignation, saying, to what purpose is this waste? For this ointment might have been sold for much and given to the poor. When Jesus understood it, he said unto them, Why trouble ye the woman? For she hath wrought a good work on me. For ye have the poor always with you, but me ye have not always. For in that she poured this ointment on my body, she did it for my burial. Jesus had been telling them over and over and over and over, I'm going to be going to Jerusalem. They're going to take me and they're going to kill me. They're going to crucify me. And they act like they didn't even hear it. It, it, it wasn't penetrating. This woman heard it. She understood what his own apostles were missing. He had said it plainly. How could they miss this? She understood and she knew he's going to die a violent death. And what you do when a body was to be buried, you'd take that body and you'd wash it off and you'd anoint it with its precious ointment, bury it with the spices. We may not even get a chance to do that. And he's about to be crucified. So she went ahead and anointed him. You know, sometimes we say, give me flowers while I'm living. And that's what she did. The ointment they would have used for his burial. She went ahead and gave it to him now. And then he said, verily I say unto you, wheresoever this gospel shall be preached in the whole world, there shall also this that this woman hath done be told as a memorial for her. And you know, that's so interesting that he said that because hasn't that been fulfilled? It's been fulfilled right here tonight, hasn't it? Hasn't it? We told the story as a memorial to her, just like Jesus said we would do. And that's what we did. But the darkness returns. Feud us. Then one of the twelve, called Judas Iscariot, went unto the chief priest and said unto them, What will you give me? And I'll deliver him unto you. And they covenanted with him for thirty pieces of silver. And from that time he sought opportunity to betray him. Now the feast, first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the disciples came to Jesus saying to him, well, well, thou that we prepare for thee to eat the Passover. He said, go into the city to such a man and say to him, the master saith, my time is at hand. I will keep the Passover at thy house with my disciples. And the disciples did as Jesus has appointed him and they made ready the Passover. Now when the even was come, he sat down with the 12. And as they did eat, he said, verily I say unto you, One of you shall betray me. And they were exceeding sorrowful. And began to say every one of them and to him, Lord, is it I? Can you hear them? Every one of them said it. Is it I? 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 And he answered and said, He that dippeth his hand with me in the dish, the same shall betray me. 
The Son of Man goeth as it is written of him, but woe unto that man by whom the Son of Man is betrayed. It is good for that man that he had not been born. Then Judas. Judas knew what he was doing. He'd already made the bargain. Judas. After those 11, it said, is it I? Now number 12. Judas, which portrayed him, answered and said, Master, is it I? And he said unto him, Thou hast said. Remember how we talked about that? It's like we'd say to you said it. He didn't say that to any of the other 11, did he? You said it. Okay. To be continued. We'll go to this point on the test on Wednesday night, and then we're going to pick this story up and carry it on to the end. You need to be ready. You need to be ready when the Lord comes. And here's how you, here's how you fill your lamp with oil, and here's how you trim your wick. If you're going to be ready, here's what you do. You believe the gospel and then you obey it. That's how you get ready. You repent of your sin, you confess his name before men, and you are baptized into Christ. That's how you get ready. Don't wait till someone says, the bridegroom cometh, and then try to run in here and get baptized. The door will be shut. You won't be able to do it. Now, be wise and be ready because you know not the hour when the Lord doth come. So let's sing that invitation song.